how do you guys think that the lyrical content, I mean, those stories, but also other tracks hold up? I mean, songs like Run to the Hills, for example, in the video, thinking about today's sort of climate with sort of racial issues and this and that. How do you think that these things hold up? Uh, let's see here. It's it's unfortunate that I, I that's one of the songs I hate the most. I think because it was just over. It was been there overplayed. You go. I echo. <laughs> yeah. I echo you. I almost forgot to put it on the list. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Inner Sleeve, the podcast taking a behind the scenes look at all things music. I'm Cassius Morris. Joe Pacheco joining me on the line. What's good, Joe? Smile on my face means we're talking about Iron Maiden. <laughs> That's a fact. It's a special episode today. The number yeah. of the beast 40th anniversary. This is huge. And of course, we had to jump on and cover it. All on today's episode of Inner Sleeve, we're joined by Carlo of the band Fane, of course their drummer. Fane, who's been on the show before here at Inner Sleeve, and we had some awesome commentary all about this tremendous album. And Joe, I know that this one is, I mean, I can't put words in your mouth here, but this has to be one of your favorites. Yeah, definitely. It's like a childhood memory, like an early childhood memory of picking up this vinyl, which, you know, happened to have right here next to me, is the actual vinyl I picked up for five wow. bucks. Five bucks the when vinyl. I was like, what's grade six? What is that? Like you're like, what, 11 maybe? Yeah, right? yeah. I remember picking this up on the way home from- And five uh, bucks never, is like a hundred bucks back then. Yeah, and I never had money on me. So I don't know how I got the five bucks to get this. Like my mom must have given me something for school or, or maybe they gave me back some money at the end of the year or something. I don't know, but I had five bucks. And the first thing I did was go to a flea market that I knew was on the way home. And picked up the Iron Maiden number to be. I don't know if I had wow. that intent that day because the last day of school. Or if it just happened. It just happened. I'm like, oh yeah, I definitely want this album because I was already quite familiar with it. As you'll see, it's, you know how early uh, I I kind of um, got into this uh, band and album. You know, definitely one of the quintessential records in the world of rock and metal. And we talk all about our first impressions and our great memories with this record in the full length chat that we're about to have. Real quick before we jump in, just a reminder to check out Sound Mojo on YouTube and hit that subscribe button on whichever platform you're currently tuned in on. We air on YouTube as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher Radio. So make sure to go check us out. We have tons of interactive posts on this day in music, comms tabs, and polls as we're going to get to in just a moment. And we definitely want to see you guys there as well as on our social media at Sound Mojo. KISS fans in Tennessee were in for a super special weekend at Creatures Fest, where they were surprised by not one, not two, but four former members of the group KISS. Of course, we're talking about Peter Chris, Ace Fairley, of course, the two originals, Vinnie Vincent, and Bruce Kulick, who were both their guitarists throughout the 80s. Now, this was not the extent of the lineup at Creatures Fest. It actually went beyond just former KISS members. People in Nashville, Tennessee were also treated by Quiet Riot, Enough's Enough, Quarantine, John Karabi, and Trickster at the Creatures wow. Fest in Tennessee. I mean, Trickster. pretty cool lineup, right? I never, like, I haven't heard about those guys. I didn't even know they were still doing stuff. But yeah, they were right on the tail end of the whole hair metal or glam metal, whatever you wanted to call it. They just had come out and I was already, like, starting to be a snob and be like, Trickster, what is that? No, no. I was already, <laughs> they did an acoustic already, set as well. Yeah, that's it. I was already into my Metallicas and all that stuff by that time. But uh, yeah, nice to see that they're still hanging in there and doing it. Now, the main thing with Peter and Ace was that they got on stage and they sort of reunited for strange ways, um, as you can see here. And then, of course, I think Peter did one song. He was behind the drums for one track and in front of the drums for the other. Now, Joe, this was sort of going on, I think, at a hotel, you know, sort of a convention center somewhere in Nashville. This is, you know, definitely a far cry from the arenas and stadiums that Kiss used to do. Is this a good look for Ace and Peter or is this, you know, some might say cheapening or, or taking away from the image? He's, yeah, that's a good question, man, because like both, I think there's legitimacy to both uh, claims. But at the same time, man, I mean, like, why would Peter and Ace like shy away from actual fans getting a chance to meet and perform and, you know, giving the fans something they want? Like, I don't see any harm in that, but I see what you mean. Like, it sort of feels like. These guys are, the other two guys are touring like massive festivals and stadiums if, you know, and like these guys are playing the smaller uh, uh, venues, you know. It must be a different feeling, you know, Ace even, you know, just coming off the road with Alice Cooper, they were doing, you know, I think three, four thousand seat theaters. 
Peter, on the other hand, just coming out of retirement. So, I mean, it's a completely different story for Peter. I think he's attempted to retire twice now. And it seems like he just, you know, like, like the song says that he put out Hooked on Rock and Roll, that seems to be his life story. The man cannot, you know, stop getting out there and performing. But, you know, Joe, I kind of agree. I think it's cool for them to get out there and see the fans that care for them because, yeah. you know, as a young Kiss fan who, who didn't get to see their heyday, I've still never seen Ace or Peter perform. And, you know, if this was happening in my Same city, here. I would definitely go. Same here. Like, I mean, I don't know if I would go. That I'll be honest with you. But, like, I haven't... I have seen Kiss way back in, uh, like, 1990, I think, with uh, Bruce Kulick, right? Yeah. And... um and like I always say from that show, my takeaway besides, you know, liking the stuff and enjoying the show was that like um, Gene and, and and Paul are just like massive performers. I always say that Paul was had a rib, uh, had two bruised ribs or something, had like a whole yeah. bandage around and did not suffer. Did The show didn't suffer one bit. Man, those guys were like impressed me in terms of performance. It's so insane to see and, you know, definitely good for the KISS fans as well to get some rare songs, Strange Ways, you know, one of the most rare songs, I think, in the KISS catalog, yeah. getting to see it live. Uh, Peter did appear throughout the rest of the weekend, but really the main headliner and takeaway from this weekend that almost overshadowed everything else was the appearance of Vinnie Vincent. Now, for anybody who knows KISS, or <laughs> if you don't know, let me fill you in. Vinnie Vincent was in the group for two albums in the 1980s and ended up becoming a, an extremely elusive guy. He disappeared and he wasn't mm -hmm. seen or heard from for many years until his arrest in, you know, the mid 2010s. He's since dabbled with coming back out of retirement here and there, but this was the first major show that was billed for Vinnie. And as you can see here, Vinnie came out and performed on a tank, which was reminiscent of the tank in the Creatures of the Night Kiss tour. So this is... I mean, this is a whole, a whole kiss thing for Vinny. Yeah, I mean, I uh, for me, Vinny, like I remember, he was you know the big news when uh, Ace Frehley wasn't in Kiss anymore. I was you know I don't know ten years old, eleven years old maybe, and it, or and it was like, oh, what happened? What happened? You know, and then you heard a new guy, Vinny Vincent, such a catchy name with a flying V guitar, being such a young kid, being impressed by the flying V and like and the songs were cool and everything. So, but like he, it was so short lived because all of a sudden there was. He was gone, right? And yeah. like, and then never heard from again. So enigmatic. Like, whatever happened to this guy, you know? And then like, we, now obviously we see him uh, resurface. So it's interesting. It's so strange to see as well the fact that he's coming back out in a variation of his Kiss makeup. Now, reports from the actual event have said that the makeup that he's wearing is just a variation of his Kiss makeup. It's not the exact wow. design because I guess he's trying to avoid lawsuits, which <laughs> is pretty smart, Joe. <laughs> well, man, I'm surprised. Like, I didn't ever thought of that. That even obviously, yeah, it's a look. It's an image, right? So, like, I, I'm assuming they own the rights to it, and like, uh, he's playing it safe. Uh, smart man. <laughs> now, as promised, this episode is all about Iron Maiden, and leading into our discussion on Number of the Beast, we have a wild story from the world of Maiden themselves. Paul Diano, of course, the original Iron Maiden vocalist. This is well before Blaze Bailey. This is well before Bruce Dickinson. Uh, he came back to meet Steve Harris, of course, their bassist and founder, face to face for the first time in 30 years, Joe. 30 yeah, years. Man. I can't imagine the emotions that were flying around in this room. Yeah, I don't know the backstory besides like, I don't know, like, were they not talking for 30 years or is just... I don't think they talked, and if they did, it was sparingly. I know that Deanna has publicly said very negative things about Steve, negative things oh, okay. about Bruce for, through the years. So, because well, he, you know, I'm sure he got like the short end of the stick, he got canned, and then they took off. I mean, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I, I can feel for him, but I mean, he's still like, like, Maiden fans still love him because, like, he's on the first two albums and, like, uh, Killers is an epic album. I love that album. Yeah, definitely a different sort of, like you were saying, like a stream, like a, a steampunk, street punk sort of kind of sound, like just a, a weird, yeah, were different more, thing for Maiden. More, like, brutal, not brutal, but, like, you know, they were more punky, more aggressive. And, and like, as we say in the uh, Number of the Beast, y you could feel that evolution on that album, which, you know, new drummer, new singer, and probably, you know, just fresh approach from the band ish you know and, oh yeah uh, yeah so we got you know iron made a uh, number of the beast but i mean yeah he's uh not do doing too good right uh paul diano 
Well, no. Paul is actually over, I believe he's in Croatia at this yeah. point, uh, getting different drainage surgeries and different procedures, preparing for a major knee operation. So this is, you know, hence why he's in a wheelchair here, as you guys can see. But nonetheless, yeah. still appearing at the show. And here we even have a video of Paul actually in the audience watching Maiden, which is... Now, I can't tell what exactly his expression is in this video. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if he's happy, if he's sad, maybe both. Uh, yeah, just by the side there, it looked like a bit of, um, like, nostalgia, but a bit also of, like, uh, bittersweet, you know, in the sense that that could have been me, you know, or, like, these guys are still uh, up and running and, like, you know, uh, I'm I, he has all these issues or whatever, you know. But uh, good to see, like, it's, we mentioned this before, like, this is not the first one we've seen, like, of, you know, founding members or, like, older members uh, reuniting and getting to see their um, their bandmates. Right. We had, well, this like, is reminiscent uh, of the Dream Theater situation yeah. with with Mike Portnoy. Yeah, you know, founding guy, you know, like, and after ten years of like separation, not as long as thirty for these two these guys, but um, yeah, and like getting to reunite with their band. I, you know, I wonder, I wonder, I, I wonder how that feels. You know, like fans approaching a, him, taking pictures as well. You know, all throughout the show, which. It must have been a special experience, you know, and that's the thing with these these bands. I find it interesting and, you know, fascinating that all these guys are reuniting and sort of making amends at the same sort of time. Because, listen, guys, this isn't a coincidence. These guys aren't getting any younger. They all started at the same era, so they're all going to retire around the same era. And I think it's really nice to see a lot of the petty crap dissipate because these guys have yes. created some pretty amazing things together. Yeah, yeah, I know, like myself getting up in the years as well, you know, you you think a lot of the stuff you used to hold on so tight to, you know, and like whatever, it's like, it's kind of pointless when, you know, you when you're at that, you know, and or, or when someone is suffering like he is, you know, it's like, I'm sure they, they also took that into account as like, man, you know, we don't know how much time we have left with this guy, right? So, yeah, make the wow. most of it. Unbelievable. Well, definitely something special for the fans. And I know we wish Paul Deano all the best. And listen, good to see Maiden still on the road. I mean, as we talked about in the chat, you guys are about to see one of the most consistent bands in music history and, you know, consistent acts, I think, in music history. Yeah. 100%. Now, we ran a poll on our Sound Mojo YouTube page, and this is interesting. We asked you guys what you think is the best Iron Maiden album. And here are the answers. Now, Joe, this is a bit surprising to me on one hand, but on the other hand, I think it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you said that because like when I, went, when I first posted it, I mean, I mean, they have like, what, 20, 30 albums, these guys? So it's like, we just have to pick, they only give you five options. So we pick, you know, Power Slave, Somewhere in Time, Number of the Beast, Brave New World. Uh, and like, and like we asked people to leave comments. We didn't get any comments, but I mean, like at one point yesterday I was checking this and like somewhere in time, a number of the beasts were neck and neck, like they were tied. Wow. And then it just, number of the beasts just took off. So I was, uh, as you see, well, if you're on the video, you can see here we're at 45% for number of the beasts, 16 and power slave. That, that, you know, that's like, I mean, they're all warranted, you know, they're all amazing albums. And it's funny because when I was editing the, uh, the interview with Carl, well, the interview, the, 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 the number of the beast thing, you know, I was listening to somewhere in time while I was doing it. And I was just hey. kept like, well, actually not true. I listened to number of the beast, power slave and somewhere of time while I was putting it all nice. together. And like <laughs> trifecta. Yeah, man, it's just, they're just such incredible albums. So it's like, you know, it's, it's not surprising to see number of the beast because that's probably where I think the majority of the fans, I think really got into this band. I think, what do you think? I totally agree. You know, as you were saying earlier when we were talking about Paul Diano, you know, like the the shift in musicality in general at this album was was yeah. remarkably pronounced. You know, the vocals, the writing, the the concepts, I think everything just took another level and it really I think launched Maiden into the band we know today maybe. Like I think the Maiden that people of my my era know more is more founded on that number of the beast and on yeah. era. I would, that's a safe thing to say, but like also the fact that like there's some stuff on, on, on number of the beast that you won't find on some other albums, right? They've outgrown mm -hmm. certain songs, you know, and like yep. the maiden sound came in. Cause after this was what the uh, peace of mind. Right. And then it was power mm -hmm. slave and then somewhere in time. And when you get to somewhere in time, I mean, I know we're talking about number of the beast, but when you get to somewhere in time, man, there's just this maturity in the songwriting yeah. and even power slave. Like, I mean, every time I listen to power slave, it's like, almost like I forget about it. And like, Oh, my God, this album's so amazing. You yeah, know? this album's so good. It's almost I like a concept kinda. album, but not quite, which which almost makes me like it more. You know, they like yeah. they, they kind of have a concept of the whole Egyptian theme, 
But again, mm. when you get too carried away with that too, you can ruin the ruin the record. That's it. Well, anyway, like thank you for participating on the in the poll, and uh, you know, be sure to keep checking back for more as we're going to keep putting more daily. Uh, and now, without further ado, we'll go into our uh, Iron Maiden 40th anniversary of Number of the Beast with Carlo from Fane, and we hope you enjoy. We'll see you on the other side. We're joined by a very special guest, Carlo, to discuss the Number of the Beast. What's going on, Carlo? Nothing much, man. How are you? Hey, doing great. We're, we're happy to have you on. Talking for about 40 me. years, 100%, 40 years, guys, yeah. of an incredible staple in the metal world. Joe, I mean, does it feel real 40 years? This is insane. I'm, I'm going to cringe a little here, but I mean, I was there when it, when it was released, so <laughs> it's a little you shocking, you know? It's literally, it's shocking, man. It's like, what? See, you're what dating yourself about? and I'm dating myself. We're both dating ourselves in the opposite direction right now, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah that, that, that's what's cool about this whole thing, you know? We, like, talk about it from three different perspectives, you know? I just wanted to mention that Carlos in the band was mo- uh, some sound mojo uh if you watch the channel regularly, you'll know he's from the band Fane. He's the drummer of the band Fane. This is why we uh, invited him here to talk about uh, Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast. <laughs> Since you're the guest, you know, we'll let you go first. Like, what's your first memory? What's the vibe? Well, let's see. I, I, I guess then I'm not as old as you are. I thought we were close to the same age, but um, <laughs> by the time I got to see them live for the first time was um, 1995. Uh, wow. They were playing Verdun Auditorium here in Montreal. Yeah. First memory. Um, I had gotten Number of the Beast from a friend of mine. You know, the usual, we had tapes, everybody, you know, make copies and stuff. And um, Number of the Beast was the track, you know, that we over listened to kind of thing, but it kind of, it was a gateway to every other album. Yeah. Um, when we first saw them, uh, I was 14. I think Fear Factory was opening up. Uh, the only downfall, though, was that Bruce Dickinson was not singing live. It was um, Blaze Bailey. Oh, okay. wow, really? Yeah. You got to see Blaze, the rare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was rare. You know what? It was one of my first shows ever. So for me, you know, I was freaking out the whole time anyways. So did you know the band already? You knew of Iron Maiden? You like you were a fan already? By the time I had uh, went to that show, I had every record to date. Oh, okay. I had went wow. to HMV, I think at the time, or signed the record man, I can't remember. And I think I just took all the CDs and just, and some of the oh, tapes because wow. I couldn't find the CDs and I just bought everything in one shot. Oh, wow. Wow. Fell in love like, right away. It's so different compared to now where, where you would just, you know, quickly add everything to your phone. I mean, <laughs> do you miss those days or, or do you prefer like the convenience now? Uh, I do miss them. I do think that also the artwork and stuff like, you know, in front in your hands was, uh, was cool opening the book for the first time, reading the lyrics, uh, especially for some bands that, you know, you, you, uh, you couldn't get, obviously you couldn't get them online at the time. So you, your only choice was, you know, opening that record. Um, but yeah, I do miss them big time. Yeah. What about you, Joe? Any, any memories of that sort of time with this record? Yeah, yeah. For me, it was like a local station here, Shom, used to used to play. Uh, like I heard it on the radio for the first time. I was I was really young, man. I think, I mean, it was released in '82, so like I was like seven, eight, maybe. You know, so very impressionable. You know, and like I was already getting into this because I was I was addicted to radio because like that's all we really had. You know, so I was on TV, obviously. But I, mean, I was addicted to radio, just always on. I carried it with me. I brought it everywhere I went. You know, and uh, so I was listening to it. I remember like. Just that intro, you know, like um, the the intro, the, the the book of Revelations, the way it was read, and then the guitar riff, and it just kept building, and then the singer with the big scream, that you know, right? Yeah, so that was my first memory listening to it on FM radio when they were actually most likely debuting it. Wow! Uh, yeah, I would say that you're really lucky, man. I didn't know that. Uh, first of all, that you were that old. And then, and then, oh, <laughs> doing it but, Frank for, but, for the age yeah. joke. <laughs> no, actually, you, you uh, I had no idea. I really thought we were the same age um, for some reason. But then again, you you look fantastic, Joe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you, <laughs> if you heard that, if you heard that on the radio, then uh, man, that must yeah. have been one hell of a feeling because the I think the the earliest uh, at that time, actually in the nineties, metal wasn't even playing on the radio anymore. It was alternative That's and it. stuff. So, uh, man, you got to live out those days. 
cool. that's why I'm like the perfect like like I'm 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 also angry with radio that doesn't play it. Like you used to play it, man. You used to play this stuff. Maybe it was like it was at 10 p.m. or something late at night. You know, the top 10 at 10. I remember they used to have a show like that here. And uh, yeah. I discovered so much to that. That's where I heard Ozzy. That's where I heard Def Leppard. That's where I heard like all those guys, you know, new albums coming out all the time. You were like, you, you know, we didn't have all the social media. We just like, you heard about it, man. And as a kid, you just didn't forget. Oh, I'm going to check out that band because that guy was my brother. My older brother was talking about it, you know, so it's like, I'm as it comes in real or, time too. Or we'd see, I'd see yeah. magazines, you know, like Motley Crue was another big thing, but it wasn't yet, you know, like I, I that was the next phase. This is my introduction sort of into... Uh, let's say metal. So like, I mean, 82, uh, what was I in grade three, four? You know what I mean? I was like super, super young. <laughs> Had you seen the video? Like metal. Had you seen the video for Number of the Beast? No, no. no I don't know if Music Bliss maybe was playing it at the time. Um, no, I don't, they weren't even a thing yet. MTV wasn't a thing yet, man. Like, yeah, really? <laughs> I'm really digging oh, wow. myself. I'm going to chop all this off just so everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> we got a two minute episode with what we have left. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, what about that. you, Cash? Is, what's your take on this? For me, I mean, man, th this record was special for me because. I mean, I was in the third or fourth grade, a lot more recently, I guess. Uh, but I was given a, a gift card. It was like a $45 gift card from my grandparents for Christmas to uh, the Play CD store at the time. And uh, so I went in there and I got in like the fourth grade, my first rock and metal album. So it was Kiss Greatest Hits, like the 20th Century Masters. Wow. Uh, for those about to rock, we salute you and Number of the Beast. Mm. So that was like the, the most kick-ass starter pack I could have ever had. So that I came home, obviously looked at the booklet, yeah. put all the little pictures up on my wall and stuff. And uh, it's like, that was it. You know, the rest was history. So like, how I many, like, did you listen to it a lot right away? Like, yeah, I, I think yeah. Maiden was my first favorite band. Like they were the, yeah. the ones that I was just hooked on, especially because of the visuals. Like when I saw Eddie yeah. with the devil's head, the, yeah. My my head exploded. Like it was just it was over from that moment on. Yeah, right here, you know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, but the one on the back. Remember the one on the back? I think yeah. So my back here too, I believe. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. That might be it. Yeah. Where we, we takes the devil's head off. But no, I mean, like I, I think you know the big vocals, and maybe I'll ask you guys what really caught your attention about it. But for me, it was the big vocals and the artwork. I don't know about you. Uh, let's see. For me, it would have always been the. Um... The vocals were obviously the, like the first thing that you would hear because of the, how powerful Bruce Dickinson was at, uh, was at the time. But then again, for me, it was always the melodies. As soon as I heard those two guitars in harmony, for me, I was sold. The yeah. shivers began and, and that's mm -hmm. it. You know, I would always want or, or expect that middle section or that, that epic part at the end where, or any song mm -hmm. where they yeah. have those harmonies, uh, harmonized guitars. That's where it sticks out the most for me. What do you say, Joe? Yeah, like I said earlier on, it was just the, 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 the just as it was like sort of getting bigger and bigger and just slowly mm -hmm. the crescendo building to this yeah. climax. Yeah. And the riff too, when the riff comes in, you know, like that's like, oh, wow, it solidifies everything. You know, that it's such a cool, like, and it's cool to play on the guitar. It looks cool while you're playing it on the guitar, you know? It's like, yeah. always. <laughs> it's a good riff. And same thing with your harmonies, man, melodies. I mean, like I grew up on like a, a diet of, let's say, Def Leppard and like, so you have all those vocal harmonies, right? But then you have Iron Maiden with all the guitar harmonies, dual yeah. guitar parts. I mean, I played, I think, honestly, like if I would have to count, like they all the bands that I went really nuts over, you know, like the Metallica phase yeah. and the dream theater phase and all that stuff, you know? And, and like, I think like Maiden is the band that's like, I've listened to the longest of all because yeah. I was such a, a young age. Right. So it's like, I've always, I'm always just like forever a fan, even though I don't follow them as much now. Yeah. I, I don't know if you guys follow well, yeah. them now. I follow them. I see stuff, but I mean, I don't really listen to the albums as much, you know, I'll check it out. I've gone to a show and I was completely lost. <laughs> because like I had, really? there was such a gap, and they did very little of the of the catalog I knew, which is they seven did a bunch albums. Of new stuff. Yeah, yeah, which is seven albums of catalog. But no, they did like, you know, the last four or five albums at the time, you know, and it was like really surprising. Well, the um, which show did you go to last? Because the last one I think I went to see was in twenty nineteen, and they I think they weren't on tour for a record, and they they basically played the catalog that we know. And yeah, it was like the memory plus of or the minus the two or songs, right? Uh, I think that that was the one or legacy of the beast. Yeah. So they did the whole, the whole back catalog. That yeah. must've been cool. Oh man, it was insane. Uh, they, what sounded like uh, might've been, you know, a, a bit of um, uh, 
you know, you don't know what you're going to get kind of thing. And yeah. we went there and um, we all lost our voices. <laughs> like, 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 you know, like we were 16 again. Yeah. But um, in comparison to, because I think I've seen them six times already, when oh. they tour for a record, uh, like you said, Joel, you know, you, you get there and you're lost because I don't follow anything past uh, X Factor, you know, and the only okay. reason why I know X Factor is because that was the first show I ever went to see in 95. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So anything anything after that is Same. a bit, you know. Yeah, for me, it's actually even before Fear of the Dark was the last. Uh, oh, well, yeah. Wow. That's where I checked out, you know. Like, <laughs> but I mean, what a like even like even if the like I, I don't feel bad for not following them. I'm happy because when I see them, like they have double the catalog of when I left, but I have seven fantastic albums, yeah. man, that are just lot. masterpieces, you know? Not many for bands sure. can say that, right? And then, no. like, you see them, like, same thing with Metallica, the first four albums for me are, like, the bomb, you know? The rest is like, okay, I moved on, you know, my taste changed or whatever, but the both bands got bigger, and, yeah. you know, you watch them in Brazil, there's 200, 300,000 people, Chills. you know, like, watching these, yeah, and, like, we do on this day here, and, like, you know, Cassius will choose some of the, ch the 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 clips, and he'll tell me, and then he writes me, "Man, dude, that Maiden clip just gave me a uh, just gave me goosebumps." And then yeah. at this point, I'm like, "Me too." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah like, seriously. Just just no, hearing so the insane. audience, it's so insane. Yeah. yeah, all that energy and that power. For me, I, I recently saw Bruce Dickinson last month do a speaking show. Actually, yeah. uh, it was a one man show. It was interesting for sure. And but other than that, I've only got to see Maiden one time. But what I did was I came uh, with my fifth grade uh, live after death flag. And I was doing I was trying to do it like Brazil style, waving the flag in the crowd and taking pictures. Um, but definitely, I think, you know, it's hard to argue one of the greatest live bands in music always yeah. yeah all the time and like and like they never phone in a performance eh? it's no. always like dickinson is just the whole way just like the stones you know they always just they're full-on performance i'll just give it to bruce dickinson though he could run and sing yeah. still at this age it's yeah. it's, it's not normal madman <laughs> perfect so shape, insane. I was just gonna say what do you think of like the sonics of it you know like it's 40 years now like when i pop when i put it on obviously it's nowhere near as loud and as brutal as some of the the stuff we're used to today right yeah. but you know and then i just you know i found this really cool trick when i put older albums on is i just go to the volume knob and i turn it louder i think that's the only way and it's just like and it works you know but honestly seriously though like the sonics of it does it still hold up you think like in terms of like the, the remastered versions, I would say it gets close. Again, if you turn it up and maybe scoop your 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 little EQ in your car kind of thing, um, you know, raise, you know, you, you got to play with those levels the because anything, face. yeah, you got to put the smiley face on that EQ. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, surprisingly, man, like those, uh, those records, how they were done back then, you would think that they would sound a lot worse and compared to today's standards. But yeah. they don't. I think that because they were recorded analog, you still have that that fatness. You still have that room with the bass and the and the drums still cut through no matter what. Yeah, I think yeah. like I think like this one, like example, like yeah, I, I find like the earlier albums were with Paul Diano, the original. See, this is Bruce uh, Dickinson's. Yeah. This is Bruce Dickinson's like first album and the last for the drummer, which I'm not sure yeah. if you were aware. Of. It was Clive Burr. It's not the same. Yeah, right. It's not Nico. Yes, yeah, right. uh, true. Yeah, that's it. So it's like it has a different feel. And I found like I always found them more punky in the beginning, right? Yeah, they sound they had a bit more of a raw, like yeah. Killers was a, a nice punk. Well, that, that classic record, yeah. UK, yeah, the classic yeah. UK sound, you know? That's it. So this yeah. one where you get stuff like Number of the Beast, a little more conceptual, right? Children of the Damned, right? Yeah. Uh, Hallowed Be Thy Name, Run to the Hills. It starts to like really like evolve into Maiden. That's like, right. You know, and it's, like, it's so funny to go. stories and topics, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, and yeah, exactly. More topics. Like I always say this. You, you always like I always I, you can quote me for saying this. I always say I learned a, a lot of history through this band. <laughs> yeah, seriously. You know, yeah, you're right, you're right. The pyramids and the whole deal. Yeah, that's it. You know, so I learned a lot of stuff. You know, Samuel Taylor Caldridge, Caldridge and all these like yeah. you know uh, interesting. You know, even like you know just doing the research for here, some of the songs like uh, um, Number of the Beast. You know, it's like it's basically it's based on the 1978 movie Omen Two. Yes, that's right. Uh, Damien, right? And like it's and it's not it's it's not about being a Satanist or anything, it's about a dream. 
that like or right. a nightmare that he had, Steve Harris. You know, so that's kind of the idea. You know, well, and it's like, kind of crazy. Was, yeah, uh, sorry, Joe, to interrupt, but the, the now that you mentioned the the Satan stuff and the whole yeah. horror aspect, back then, I mean, you must have probably, um, how do you say this, experienced the. Uh, you know the older parent or the or the older uncle or aunt saying, you know, this is satanic music. You can't listen to this garbage, and uh, you know, you, know, you got to throw it out. <laughs> yeah, the funny. teachers. Yeah, yeah, teachers maybe, but like I find like I was lucky in that way. You know, like I didn't really get much slack really? or anything. Yeah, I know. Surprisingly, you know, I, I was. This is a funny story. You know, I, like a shirt like this. You know, nice. Yeah. If it was new, my mom would have let's say bought it for me. But like, and it would be like, okay, it's not. It's brand new. We just bought it. Save it for church. <laughs> like, because it's new and it's not holes you know what i mean so it's like it was oh kind of, god so for me it's like hell yeah okay sure no problem oh, you're lucky oh, yes, it was the other way around man it was more of a yeah. you know immigrant parents you know they don't they know but they don't they yeah kind yeah. of they, they knew the classics you know who was around at the time michael jackson and you know, all the popular guys but yeah. when they saw that you know what kind of looked like a devil on a t-shirt or you know heavy oh, yeah. music that was not you know understood yeah, that's it. It kind of yeah. went in the garbage. Yeah, I was asked to put my killer shirt inside out in uh, gym class. See, <laughs> oh, yeah, wow, yeah, man. And, and that was in like the seventh grade. I was like, really? Because it says killers, they're like, it's written in blood. I'm like, come on, you know, but hey, I, I guess it's it's just different in every place, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. It's, but that's it's interesting true. because, like, you, you, well, for you guys, it's like that must have been like in the uh, you know mid 2000s or or more. So like 2011. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So that, 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 that is a bit more strange. Whereas like maybe in 82, like I actually just watched like this whole thing where they were talking about, you know, like when Ozzy, uh, the, the, the kids that would mm -hmm. kill themselves and stuff like that. And because of oh, yeah. Satanic and Maiden yeah. and Dickinson was saying, you know, like same thing. It's just, it's just like if you take it at the surface level, yeah. But like this stuff is based on like Village of the Damned, you know, uh, based on movies and like books and stories or poems, you know. So, like, even Edgar Allan Poe, I was introduced through this band, you know, yeah, like, a poet. So, like, that's yeah. what I, I loved about that stuff, you know? Like, like you said, you know, you read the lyrics, you're like, wow, you know, they yeah. gave you more. I mean, the artwork was something already, you know, but then you got the lyrics, you know, you listen to the album. Oh, over and over. That's it. So, I mean, to follow up on your question, Joe, you asked about the Sonics. How do you guys think that the lyrical content, I mean, those stories, but also other tracks hold up? I mean, songs like Run to the Hills, for example, in the video, thinking about today's sort of climate with sort of racial issues and this and that. How do you think that these things hold up? Uh, let's see here. It's it's unfortunate that I, I that's one of the songs I hate the most, I think, because it was just <laughs> over. It was been there overplayed. I echo, <laughs> yeah. I echo you. I almost forgot to put it on the list. <laughs> yeah, forgot it exists at this point. <laughs> but I mean. It was their like, it, it, like it was their first. There was two singles. It was Number of the Beast and obviously Run to the Hills was first, That's right. and that was their first top ten in the UK. Yeah. Oh wow! So okay. like, so it's good. Thanks. It's a good. It was good for the band. But you're right, man. Over the years, like you know, that's all they play when they actually play that once a year. They play it on the radio. <laughs> so was that? They play that song, and you're like, come on, bro! Like, there's seven other albums. <laughs> yeah. Actually, at this point, there's a, like fifteen better, other albums. You know, anything on Somewhere in Time would be better than that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, insanity. well, to, to uh, for the lyrics itself, I mean, how they hold up today. I mean, I think that uh, they discuss some issues where we are still facing today, and I think that that you know um, these issues were were kind of hidden, or sorry, these lyrics were or felt that they were kind of hidden within these tracks because you know uh, metal bands weren't taking that seriously, and at the same time, it was more of that Satanism or that symbolic of Satanism. And um, I think looking back, we they were actually trying to conquer or trying to make these issues um, come to light or, or just surface. Um, and I think that to this day, if people read the lyrics, they would actually learn something that, you know, we've been fighting these issues for a really long time, longer than anybody could ever know. Yeah. Hey Amen. Good way to put it. So, I mean, Joe, maybe we could all go around. What would you what would we say is the standout track on this record? Because mm. I'm sure we all have probably a different answer. I could, it's easier for me to tell you the songs I don't like. 
<laughs> okay. Like, to weed them out know, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Like, exactly. well, not that I don't like them, but or that I like less, right? Let's say like Gangland is just one that I just yeah. never really yeah. got into. But Throw it's cool. Throw track almost. I've listened to it so many times that it's it's cool. But like having done the research, they, they were, it's funny, this album was sort of put together very quickly or, or they ran out of time. You know, and, and mm. so like they've admitted to making mistakes like that song Gangland. They were stuck between another track and that one. And they said they regret they think that everybody would have liked the other track even more than this one. Really? Uh, yeah. And yeah, Invaders, uh, it, you know, it's a cool opener, but I, I, nothing, you know, it's like for me, it's like Children of the Damned is just such an epic piece. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, prisoner the prisoner I, I mean i really got into that song because it's it's like an oddball on their whole, so cool. their whole catalog is. you know it's like it's not the typical maiden progression feel even and like that drum intro was like obviously just the intro taking from like a spy show or something you know or a TV <laughs> yeah show. and then like that drum the free man is, yeah exactly <laughs> that drum groove is just sick man the way it comes in you know i've always like wow i was impressed with that you know uh, obviously, number of the beats. It's hard, so hard to pick, man. But like, it's like the I whole pick, album and the deluxe version with the extra tracks. That's yeah, my favorite. And, and, and even just like <laughs> just, you know, all the whole thing, all the stems. You know, everything is is, is my favorite part <laughs> of it. But you know, if I had to pick one, I guess as a well, okay, here I'll do this. I'll, I'll I'd pick number of the beast as the song. But like, if I had to put like one that I like, you know, like hearing live would be uh, "How Be That Name." Ah, yeah. hell yeah. What about you, Carlo? Um, I'm going to be biased to how it be thy name just because the, uh, it's a track that I could listen to over and over again, again, the harmonies, that beginning, that intro all the way till the song kicks in. Yeah. It just blows up in your face kind of thing. The imagery but, he creates. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Uh, it's also been redone by a, a shit ton of bands, uh, like Cradle of Filth did a really good version of it. Yeah. Um, but I am a little, um, Let's see here. I'm a, I am a little biased towards uh, the prisoner, and the yeah. reason is is because I actually used that lyric in my high school um, <laughs> yearbook, which is I'm not a, I'm not a prisoner. I'm a free man. A free man. That's because nah, you know, yeah. we we felt like we were in prison throughout high yeah. school. <laughs> little did we know we're actually still in prison. But yeah, still in a prison, <laughs> different one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love taxes. that. What about you, Cassius? You know, for me, I gotta say it's really really tough. I mean, the, the, everything is so strong, but I think Children of the Damned, I mean, I think that has to be at least top 15 Maiden tracks ever. I mean, it's just so epic, every <laughs> piece of it, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know if you agree or disagree, Joe, I can't tell, but. 100%. <laughs> you agree? 100%. It's a great oh, yeah, song, yeah. hands down. It's yeah. amazing, yeah. epic. The sands of time for me are So I mean, what would what, what would we give this maybe out of ten? Ten. <laughs> the album itself. <laughs> yeah. I think because it, it influenced so many people, I would have to give it a ten. There's there's no yeah. other way. It's influenced so many other bands, uh, including bands that were around at that time, uh, yeah. including Metallica. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's not yeah, forget. Yeah. So nine and a half. I have to give it for sure. <laughs> nine, nine and yeah, a half. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. what about it. like uh, amongst other al other Maiden albums? Is it your favorite mm. amongst the other Maiden albums, or not? No, uh, no definitely no. for me. Like I, I said a second ago, somewhere in time, uh, yeah. anything off that record just definitely blows uh, blows me away for sure. Yeah, you, Carlo. It's a tie between uh, Seven Sun and um, Power Slave. Oh my god, I forgot I, about Power Slave. Yeah, oh, Power, Power Slave. Slave. So yeah, Power good. Slave has some oh. really dark stuff yeah. in there, but Seven Sun, I find that every track I can listen to the album front to back. I don't think there's one track that I don't like. Power Slave, yeah. there's I think two, but Seven yeah. Sun is like a great overall, amazing. It's full of harmonies. So like for me, it's uh yeah. it's uh, how do you call it goosebump heaven, you know? Yeah. I think <laughs> uh, same here, man. Like when I listen to those albums, you know. 
but I mean, with caches, it's true. Like I remember, I went through a phase where I think it was like only some caught uh, somewhere in time. <laughs> yeah, where it just like it just went from like being a great uh, made an album to just like kept getting better and better and better. And then I would get to peace of mind and like, oh, okay, peace of mind goes up. Mm. It's it, it really it's almost like the last one I heard is the best one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, every, every time. Yeah. yeah, it's that such an insane group. And I mean, I know we could go for hours on them. Uh, do we want to maybe sum it up with a final takeaway at all, or anything else we want to add? Well, look, if I could just put some like some stats here, like uh, in 2010, 14 million copies had been sold. In, wow. But by December 2021, worldwide, 20 million copies of that album had been sold. Wow. Uh, fa- the, it was the band's first top, uh, first, yeah, first record to enter the, the um, to top the UK charts, entering at number one yeah. on April 10th, uh, maintaining the position for a further week and then staying there for in the top 75 for another 30, 31 weeks. Wow. So it was pretty good. I don't know if like they've yeah. ever had that kind of al- charting album success, but not necessarily like successful album, you know? That's right. Um, but it's pretty interesting, man, you know? like, uh, And this is like all in like 82, man, 40 years ago. If, if I could say anything about that, I think that uh, Number of the Beast is a great album. If you don't like or if you don't know Iron Maiden, it's mm-hmm. probably a great album to start with. Yeah. So I'll start from 40 years ago and then either work your way back or front. Yeah, yeah. But regardless of the fact that their live records still kick ass till this day. So Number of the Beast on the album Life After Death will rip apart any mm. of their studio records or any <laughs> studio version Amen. of Number of the Beast. Because Life, yeah. After, Life After Death is, is probably their best uh, live record, which I think came out around the time of Power Slave. Yeah. But, Ace is high. There you I go. Remember. Ace is high. Oh my God. Ace yeah. is high. The, yeah. I think that's like probably... Probably my favorite album opener would be, or even yeah, show yeah. opener. Like every time I go see them, I'm like, please start with Aces High. Please start <laughs> oh, with Aces High. <laughs> so Carl, before we go, I'm curious yeah. because I, I honestly didn't know you were that much of a Maiden fan. So like, have you ever played them live? Uh, I played wish. Songs? I never actually had anybody uh, or knew anybody oh, that man. liked Maiden up until uh, a guy that I've been jamming with recently, my buddy Ryan. He's actually uh, the biggest Maiden fan. You can't really tell because he's into a lot of obscure stuff. But um, from he's got them all, man, from documentaries to, to albums to vinyls to you name That's it. That's funny because yeah. I, I, when I was playing in clubs back in the day, we used to do like Metallica and stuff. Exactly. I think our, I think our set... Oh, man. If, let's say we had like a 10-song set or whatever, like 15. I think nine of them were Maiden songs. What? Uh, man, that would have been sick, man. I wish he, I was the drummer uh, of that dude. band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we just like we just always made it, man. And we'd start to show off with Caught Somewhere in Time because it's like, oh my so God. epic. Hallow Be Thy Name was probably that's why I say it, like live. I love to play that song live. It's yeah. just so amazing. Incredible to play live, live song. You know? Well, I but think anyway, the yeah. only the only track we've ever played live, at least with some some older guys that I used to know back in the day, was um uh, um what's it called? Wasted Years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was yeah. thinking we said yours oh. was a good try. It wasn't my favorite, but it was the only one that the guy I knew at the time knew how to sing. Because yeah, I mean, right. you can't really replicate Bruce Dickinson unless you have that operatic voice, you know. So, yeah. so it kind of always got thrown on the back burner, you know. So we never really got <laughs> yeah. to play any maiden tracks. I wish. <laughs> Oh, that's Damn, so I gotta try that now. I, I gotta get in the band now, guys. What the heck? <laughs> I feel left out. I love it. Yeah, definitely an incredible record. And that wraps up our chat on the number of the beasts. Thank you for tuning in to Sound Mojo. And Carlo, thank you so much for checking in with us and being a guest. Is there anything you want to tell us that's going on with Fane or or any uh, socials you want to promote? Yeah, thanks for asking, man. Honestly, uh well, I really appreciate being on this uh, show. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as far as Fane is concerned, uh, we're going to be releasing a live um, four-song EP uh, within the next month or so. Nice. There's a, uh, four live videos and four uh, uh, separate audio tracks that will be released on Spotify and YouTube. Um, for now, that's pretty much it. It was something that we did last year. Uh, we we did, you know still through uh, the COVID uh, days, so it's uh, filmed with no one there. Uh, it's actually really cool, but uh, we're excited to release it, man. Nice, can't wait to hear it actually. And uh, yeah. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have Hubris on the channel uh, uh, shortly right, yeah. as well. Can't wait an- another song. So yeah, look forward to that, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Well, it's you guys <laughs> yeah. helping us out, man. And honestly, yeah, man. if it wasn't for Sam Mojo, there's some of those uh, some of those new fans that we got from you guys were uh, really awesome people, and uh, the engagement hasn't stopped. So thank yeah. you very much awesome. for your support.
Huge shout out to Carlo of Fane for joining us for this special roundtable chat on Inner Sleeve. This was an awesome convo and definitely centered around an album I think that's important to all of us, Joe. You know, I mean, it was cool hearing all of our backstories, you know. I always yeah. like the fact that everyone can have this commonality. We can be looking at the same cover, hearing the that's same it. songs, but the, the, the details about that and how it relates to us is completely different. Yeah, what I loved about it is like me being so young, I was actually there when it was launched. Like I'm not physically there, but I mean I was around and I heard the, you know the songs being played on uh, local radio, and then it was. Like I, I would say this, like I'd be first generation listener, second generation listener would probably be Carlo more in the mid nineties. Mm -hmm. And he actually got in to it on the Blaze Bailey album, which Blaze yeah. only has one album, right? I think that was X Factor, I think, if I'm not yep, mistaken. Yeah, we saw the tour as well. Yeah, that's it. Like so and, and then you got into him because you were born later, so you got into them. So it's like it's it's, it's to what you said, like it's incredible to see the power of this band uh through the generations and like this album particularly. Um you know, like still influencing people and still, like Carlo said, maybe it's a good intro to Iron Maiden, you know? So you get a bit of the earlier Iron Maiden, like a, there's still a bit of the punkiness, you know, like that, that mm -hmm. kind of raw sound. But the polish really started to come in with songs like uh, uh, Children of the Damned or um, yeah. um, the last one. I forgot. I keep saying, I keep forgetting. Hollow that one, Be That Name. Yes, Hollow Be That Name. <laughs> I don't know why I said it so weird, but. <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah, but like, yeah, exactly. So like. I find like that song ends that album so perfectly and then like also kind of just like it paints a picture for what's to come in terms of like yeah. the Iron Maiden sound, right? That's the thing. Songs like Invaders and, you know, maybe even 22 Acacia Avenue sort of got left behind and they yeah. sort of kept going forward into that polished, you know, like Joe's saying, sound. I think it's tremendous. And definitely, you know, we, we could talk Maiden all day. I know that. We, we got to cut it off at some point, but yeah. Well, I mean, I say polished, but I mean, it's not like polished. It's just, it became the Maiden sound, I find, you know? Like, I think the oh, definition, yeah. when you think of Iron Maiden, that's what you sort of think of, the, 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 this type of sound, you know? I mean, they have evolved. Uh, you know, I haven't really followed the, the trajectory over the years, like album mm -hmm. after album. I mean, kudos to them that they still put in all the effort, that not just riding on the classic crazy seven album classic in terms of like the first phase of them but they're still putting on new records new fans i mean the audiences are only getting bigger it's 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 nuts it's just nuts this band the legacy continues the legacy of the beast it, it yeah. shall never end my friends uh, we <laughs> love it so much i'm gonna start talking like the announcer now yeah. uh and we're, we're really glad you guys checked us out here on episode number 76 of inner sleeve make sure to go check in with us on all of our socials and digital platforms that's youtube apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher radio if you're used to watching us on video check out the audio platforms catch inner sleeve on the go at the gym at work whatever the case may be. We also have merchandise, which you can check in the description below. And of course, we're on social media at SoundMojo, so make sure to come tap in with us on all of those platforms. Thanks so much for checking in. We'll catch you guys next week. <laughs>